Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. This is the two hour silver chart from NetDania. Now, what I've drawn here is something I've covered many times in the past, and I think it's probably the most important technical analysis you can do for any market, and that's going to be MACD trend analysis. So, let me explain to you the arrows that I've drawn in here. The first arrow in this series is the uh, first buy signal that we had on the MACD, and you can see that's uh, this arrow here and this arrow here. It's followed by the first sell signal, then the next buy signal, then the next sell signal, then the next buy signal, then the next sell signal, and now the current buy signal. So how do you analyze this stuff? Well, the first thing you want to notice is that this buy signal um, came off as very valid. You can see that uh, we got a buy signal at 1480. We got a nice rally to 1620. The other signal that's really important here is the sell signal that came in at this top right here. And you can see, although the MACD reset all the way down to there, you can see how far the MACD reset, the price actually moved upward in a pennant formation. formation. So you can see that this one uh, is an instance where we had an upward moving price and a downward moving MACD. Once that was resolved, you can see it was resolved to the upside with this buy signal, it was an explosive move. And that's what you see in trending markets. The, uh, an uptrending market has valid buy signals and invalid sell signals. This sell signal that we had right here, right there, is a horrible sell signal. Anybody who took that signal was lost from the get-go and then was wiped out. So at that point, we had a very, very strongly uptrending market. Now the next sell signal we're going to look at here is this sell signal, which corresponds with uh, this top right here. Now you can see that it went down a little bit and rallied, um, but uh, the the MACD went all the way down and reset and we got another buy signal but then the move from that buy signal has been kind of weak and we got another sell signal and then you can see the MACD reset very very low and here we are right here at uh, not a super low price we still have that trending up and trending down situation but it, the pattern seems to be weakening so I would give percentage wise about a 40% chance that we actually have a rolling over situation going on here and then I would say there's still about a 60% chance that this buy signal is actually going to turn out to be valid and we may see something uh, if this is truly a rally going on here then we're going to see something as significant as the move here so that's going to give us probably a move to 20 bucks if this one is a valid buy signal and follows the pattern that we've seen so far so that's going to resolve itself either to the upside or the downside in the next couple of days and that's something that we want to watch real closely because if you're buying on the dips then if we do get a big sell-off we're going to get some good prices on the coins we're looking at and I'm going to cover the coins here at the end but I want to jump over to this Puerto Rican debt crisis. This is a really important story because uh, what's going on here is not only do we have a test of, of the Treasury and this absolute lunatic nutcase, Jack Lou, but we also have a test of Paul the Rhino Ryan. And first off, let me observe that it's kind of interesting that we have Paul Rhino Ryan saying the exact same thing that Jack Lou is now saying that we have to get this control board in place and I'm going to explain to you and hopefully flesh out for you the reasons why they're doing this and it's certainly not the reasons that they're presenting but I wanted to remind you that we covered the Christmas bonuses I don't remember how I think it was a hundred and fifty million dollars in Christmas bonuses that that the Puerto Rican government paid out and we've got a situation now that is kind of like a uh, foreshadowing of the communism that's going on in the United States where the uh, 
the bulk of overpaid people are in the government and the private sector is being hollowed out. For Puerto Rican citizens, it's kind of a uh, fortunate situation because they are also American citizens. So they can just move, they can vote with their feet. So as they see what's coming, and I don't think they're responding to taxes as much as they're responding to the poor job market and what they believe is coming for Puerto Rico, and they're voting with their feet, they're leaving. So the the tax base gets hollowed out, but we don't see any cuts to the government. And you have to remember that this is a government, this is kind of like Paul Rhino Ryan's government. It hasn't produced a... Um, budget that can be audited so people can't really even say where the money's going it's kind of interesting that we're talking about having a deal and some are talking about bailouts when they haven't even come clean as to what they're spending the money on uh, that's absolutely absurd and the u.s congress is actually doing the same thing uh, they've gone without a budget for a very long time but let's examine the spin that jack lew is putting on this and we're going to read here the quote from him. So I'll read this introduction first. Treasury Secretary Jacob Blue strived to light a fire under congressional leaders Tuesday by calling the fiscal crisis confronting Puerto Rico immediate and real with dire consequences for the island's commonwealth, 3 to 5 million, 3.5 million citizens, as well as investment markets nationwide. Puerto Rico defaulted Monday on most of the, a debt payment of roughly $400 million. Another $1.3 billion in bond payments are due July 1st. And the island's administration has made clear that it can't meet the obligation. The island has been shut out of the debt markets while creditors await action on legislation that would restructure its debt under supervision of an independent oversight board. Quote, Hospitals continued to lay off workers, ration medication, reduce services, and close floors despite the intensifying threat from the Zika virus. Wow, that's sad. They need to bring in a fake epidemic to try to uh, keep their house of cards going. Financial constraints have made it extremely difficult to counteract. Uh, Treasury Secretary Jacob Blue. Now, the first thing I want you to think about is since when is uh, the Treasury Secretary concerned? about a human humanitarian crisis anywhere uh, and what business is it of his to talk about a humanitarian well it's not it's utterly absurd on its face that a treasury secretary is talking about hospitals uh, what a sad pathetic person he is but of course we know he's a liar because he doesn't care one whit about hospital workers or anybody who uses a hospital. The only thing he cares about is the solvency of the financial system, the gigantic house of cards that they have built, and the potential collapse on his watch. That's what he's worried about. Now let me prove that to you in the following stories here, but before I do that I want you to think about this. We know that Puerto Rico has, I believe it's roughly $72 billion worth of debt, and I think there's underfunded pensions of around 42. So we're talking about maybe $110, $120 billion worth of debt, obviously with a population of 3.5 million people and shrinking and probably 50% either working for the government or receiving government benefits, that that's an absolute catastrophe that uh, is going to happen there. Um, but so the question is, is for me, who on Wall Street is vulnerable here and what are they hiding? Well, the first question I would ask is who writes the CDS? So if you uh, follow the videos from John Titus and you look into the financial crisis, just in, as an example, I'll give you Goldman Sachs. If you remember uh, the AIG scam and that was what it was a, a gigantic scam what happened with AIG was that they rigged it using bailout money so that Goldman Sachs who was the writer of the CDS was paid a hundred cents on every dollar for their CDS contracts and we've seen something like that in uh, we saw some shenanigans in in the GM bankruptcy we saw shenanigans in Europe uh, specifically with Greece, 
So for those of you who don't remember or don't know, CDS are credit default swaps. Basically, it's insurance contract that is written on a debt. It's a, it's a derivative of a debt. And what it is, is uh, as somebody who buys bonds or really even somebody who um, doesn't have an interest, you can purchase insurance on whether or not a debt is going to be uh, defaulted on, credit default swap. And so the way it works is they pay off the rest that didn't get paid off. And uh, we've had some very shady dealings in Europe. There were some CDSs that didn't pay off, and that was because they changed the rules midstream. They, they're doing kind of tricky things like saying, well, they didn't really default. They just didn't pay. And I, I can't get into the details. It's too complex. But uh, they're rewriting the definition of default as they go. And, of course, they're going to rewrite all the rules as they go. But let's try to dig deeper into this because the big question on my mind is who owns the CDS? Because if we think about it, if there is a default, then the big issue is not going to be the bondholders who are taking a loss because probably many of the bondholders, and we'll see here in this story how cheap it was, uh, had purchased CDS. So this story is from February of 2014, and this kind of fleshes out a little bit of it. This is Puerto Rico going from bad to worse, lower CDS risk, Muni credit. So I'm just going to jump down to the CDS portion here so you can understand this. Falling cost. Puerto Rico's debt gained 3% last week, the most since October after Commonwealth officials laid out plans for their bond sale, S&P Dow Jones indices show. It cost the annual equivalent of as little as $126,000 last week to protect $10 million of munis for five years through credit default swaps, the lowest since September, according to Market Group Limited. That's down from three-month high of $146,000 on January 29th before the S&P downgrade. The cost exceeded $250,000 in 2010 in the wake of the longest recession since the 1930s. Defaults have declined in the past two years. 60 municipal issuers defaulted in 2013 for the first time, down from 126 in 2011, according to research firm uh, Municipal Market Advisors. Credit default swaps are contracts that pay the buyer face value if a borrower fails to meet obligations, less the value of the defaulted debt. The market MCDX index includes 50 such contracts of tax-exempt issuers, excluding tobacco and healthcare securities. Credit default swaps specific to Puerto Rico have fallen in price. It costs about $682,000 dollars annually to hedge $10 million of Commonwealth debt for five years through the contracts, close to the lowest since early January. Prices on contracts have dropped, even with the risk that Puerto Rico's second attempt to issue to issue since August won't happen. Soaring yields halted a plan to sell sales tax debt last quarter. If Puerto Rico is unable to access capital markets or balance its budget for the fiscal year beginning July 1st, then the financial condition of the Commonwealth may deteriorate further and its options to improve its fiscal health may be limited, according to a quarterly update. Demand will come from hedge funds and investors who typically buy taxable securities as the debt may carry double-digit yields. With the downgrade to junk behind Puerto Rico and a plan to raise more funds, investors who bought default protection can sell for a profit, said Bart Mosley. It's the only vehicle people have had to place a bet on further deterioration of the credit. Now you've got the downgrades. How much more are you expecting? Hedge funds have been buying Puerto Rico securities since last September as yields climb on concerns that the Commonwealth and its agencies would un be unable to pay the full $72 billion. Let me get down to the main point here. About $180 million of swaps on the MCDX traded during the week ending February 14th compared with $157 billion for market CDX. Um, so I, I don't see the quote here, but basically what they say in this article uh, when they're talking about the credit default swaps is they say that it is a private market 
Uh, basically what that means is that it's not reported. So here it is here. It costs about 682000 annually. Uh, according to data provider CMA, which is owned by McGraw-Hill and compiles prices quoted by dealers in the privately negotiated market. Okay, there you go. It's a privately negotiated market. So that kind of leads us to the next story here. And this is one from Seeking Alpha that actually goes quite a bit deeper into the issue. And this is truly a rabbit hole. So the name of this article is Puerto Rico and Municipal Credit Default Swap Trading Volume for 2010 to 2013. The bankruptcy of Detroit brings new pressure on municipal bond investors and related exchange traded funds, blah, blah, blah. One potential tool in that regard is the single name credit default swap market, which is featured almost constantly in discussions of municipal entity credit risk. And he gives an article. Quote, default insurance on Puerto Rico sold in the form of derivatives called credit default swaps is available from few dealer banks. The contracts also have barely traded because the protection is not available to buy in meaningful amounts and disclosures from the Commonwealth have been limited, some market participants said. The purpose of this blog is to bring clarity and precision to discussions of municipal credit default swaps by providing facts from the Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation. Yep, that's the DTCC. That's the Water Street flood, the Water Street fire. That's where they burned up all the records. It's simply not the case that Puerto Rico credit default swaps have barely traded. The DTCC data makes clear that Puerto Rico credit default swaps have never traded in any week since the DTCC began reporting weekly on trading volume beginning with the week ending July 16, 2010. In fact, only 10 municipal or sub-sovereign names have ever been reported as trades to the DTCC trade warehouse during the 2010 2013 period and it goes into a list of the people who were involved in the trading it doesn't say which credit default swaps they traded but it does have a list here of the entities involved this is daily non dealer trading volume for municipal and sub sovereign reference names of the 1,179 reference names for which DTCC reported credit default swap trades in 181 weeks, one week period, only 10 were sub sovereigns of any type. This list is unchanged for the prior uh, Kamakura report. Number one is Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. Next is the state of California, state of Florida, state of Illinois, state of Michigan, state of New Jersey, state of New York, state of Texas. City of New York City and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. There is no Puerto Rico on this list. The only other traded entities with Commonwealth in the name are Commonwealth of Australia and Commonwealth Bank of Australia. Uh, of, uh, Australia. So what does this all mean? I'm going to try to put this together for you because it, it, it's really an extreme rabbit hole here. But the first takeaway is going to be the fact that CDS market the CDS swap market, it doesn't really even exist. It is uh, a market that has no volume and it has no reportable trades. Uh, and then the other big thing is that it's a private market. And the only thing we know is there are certain banks that hold these credit default swaps. So back to the main story here with Treasury Secretary Jack Lew who's trying to convince you that he's concerned about a humanitarian crisis in Puerto Rico. No, he's not concerned about humanitarian crisis in Puerto Rico. What he's concerned about is that the credit default swap contracts will be triggered and that his masters, and you can probably uh, bet with about an 80 or 90% odds that it is Goldman Sachs and the Wall Street banks who have written insurance contracts that they have no intention of paying any money towards. So when you're talking about a bailout, that's the bailout that you're talking about. You're talking about the bailout of the people who wrote the credit default swaps. And I guarantee you, because we've already seen it in the past, these people don't pay. 
whether it has to do with Goldman Sachs getting uh, 100 cents on the dollar for their uh, AIG uh, CDS or the European CDS where they defaulted but they said it wasn't a default and so the CDS issuers didn't have to pay out. Uh, credit default swaps issued by Wall Street banks like Goldman Sachs and the rest of them, uh, they're the equivalent of uh, hurricane insurance in, in New Orleans. And uh, When the hurricane came and people who had hurricane insurance um, tried to collect, they said, no, your house was destroyed by a flood. And the people who had flood insurance tried to collect, they said, no, your house was destroyed by a hurricane. But no matter what, they are not going to pay out. That is what's behind this story. It is uh, trying to prevent a series of cascading defaults, which would impact the Wall Street banks, and those are the people that Jack Lew works for. He certainly doesn't care anything for Puerto Rican citizens. So it's going to be very interesting to watch. Uh, it's got Paul Ryan. It's got Jack Lew. It's got a collapsing socialist state. It's going to be very interesting to watch and see how they try to squiggle out of this one. So let's get over to the picks here. Uh, I've got two of them. And uh, the first one here is kind of questionable, but I want to try to explain to you why I'm looking at this. By the way, this is a two ounce, the Lunar Horse two ounce. I think they had, the last time I checked, I think they had 60 left. And well, no, there's 90. So they're asking, for this uh, two ounce horse, they're asking uh, $66. You can see the Bitcoin price. Keep that in mind, is about a dollar higher. And uh, so we're talking 67 bucks or so. Now that seems very, very high when you're talking about a silver price of $17. So uh, you're talking about $34. But you have to keep in mind when you're talking about these horses, and I own not a lot of them, but I own a number of them. Uh, one thing you want to keep in mind when you're talking about this is when those coins were available. So those coins were going to be available starting in the fall of 2013. So probably somewhere in here is when they're going to be available. And uh, they're going to stop being available, who knows, maybe in spring or later. So somewhere in here. Uh, so the average price of silver at that time uh, for two ounce, it's going to be about 40, between 40 and 44 bucks. And so I'm pretty sure, if I remember correctly, I paid about $62 for my two ounce horses. So it's, it's not fair to compare this price to the current silver price, but you want to compare this price to the price that they were available at when they were available and this is actually pretty close so this is not one that i'm going to recommend but it is one that i'm going to recommend keeping an eye on and you know if it dropped down to 60 bucks i'd probably want to pull the trigger on that one the next one is is a great buy for a number of reasons and that's going to be the half ounce monkey over here on jm bullion now, admittedly, they're not down around that 12 price, but silver has moved quite a bit. But what I think is fantastic here is that this is the first time I've noticed this on JM Bullion. We have a wire check and BTC price here that's the lowest price. So you can see if you buy 100 of these plus, you can get them for $13. Now, for those of you who have a lot of Bitcoin, this could be an interesting play because you can see if you pay with a credit card or PayPal, you're talking about 50 cents more per coin, which is a dollar more per ounce. But it's also very interesting that they're quoting the same price for Bitcoin. Now, if you think about a wire transfer, that's probably not going to be something that you're willing to do. I know, I think I've told you before, the times I tried to buy with a wire with my bank, I ended up having to go in in person to verify that I put the wire in. And I asked the guy, what's the point of having a wire transfer in my online account if every time I try to wire money, I have to come in in person and verify the wire? He said, you, you've got to understand. He kind of said, you know, just keep this quiet. But my wife's in security and, 
and the amount of hacking in, in the banking system is unbelievable. So that was interesting. Then, of course, a check. You have to send that in, wait for them to receive it, then wait for it to clear, and then you can you know, get your coins. But then you have Bitcoin here. At the lowest price, you can send your Bitcoins. I'm assuming as soon as they uh, clear on the blockchain, I haven't yet purchased any silver with Bitcoin. But uh, this is going to be a one to watch. If we get a good smackdown, we might get down to that 1250 price for these coins. And that could be a tremendous buy if you want to spend some of your Bitcoins. And looking at the last survey, considering we have some people with... Uh, 100,000 plus in bitcoins. This this might be a, a good way to spend some. So we got 1623 available. That's a pretty big number. Uh, the ones that were on Gainesville that I covered before, those are now gone. So there are no half ounce monkeys on Gainesville right now. Uh, probably one of the members bought them up. But this one is the next best deal. So back to the chart. Uh, we're going to be watching that Puerto Rico thing unfold. Um, you can see here that we're at that rolling over point on the we're on the daily MACD. Uh, you can see the daily MACD is, is doing a rollover as well. So it's going to be very interesting in the next day or two to see if the uptrend continues with the the buys coming in on the buy signals and uh, the sell signals failing. And we'll talk to you next time.